Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to GESF Live 2018. Please welcome your host, Mr. Rory Bremner. Thank you so much. What a great band. Welcome to GESF Live, coming to you live from the heart of the Global Education and Skills Forum at the Atlantis Palm in Dubai. And let's face it, nothing says education more than a giant pink fantasy palace in the Persian Gulf. Uh, I'm Rory Brenner, and I'm your host for today's show, which is being live streamed around the world from our mercifully air-conditioned studio. Uh, it's great to see so many people here. So, you know, I want to say, I don't think we've ever seen so many people at a conference before, really. There's got to be 50 million people here. <laughs> got to be 50 million. They tell me there's a couple of hundred people in the studio today. They're such dishonest people. There's got to be 20,000. 20,000 people, beautiful, wonderful people. I know them all. I know them all. They're great friends. Thank you. You can clap. It's OK. Thank you. Big Republicans in this part of the world. We've got delegates from all around the world, not just the UAE, they've come from Europe, they've come from USA, Canada, India, Japan, even from the other end of the Atlantis Palm. A long way. Big place, Dubai. Isn't it a magnificent hotel, by the way? The Palm, it's wonderful, it's great. I, my room is a 10 minute taxi ride away from the lift lobby. Um, you enjoying the conference? Great conferences. This is, this is actually quite a remarkable thing. Bringing together teachers, educationalists, role models from all around the world, all brought together here because they share a passion for spending a weekend in Dubai. So, no, education. Education. Sorry, share a passion for education. I thought we'd change that. Um, there are teachers from the UK who are going on strike just to be here this weekend. That's how big this event is. There's a House of Commons themed debating chamber. There's a United Nations inspired international forum. There's a future zone. There's cafes, there's plenaries, the lot. And we have the Global Teacher Prize, which is being awarded this evening. Uh, if you're attending the conference, don't forget, you can go online anytime, GESF 2018, but use the password education. There's Wi-Fi everywhere these days. I was at a funeral uh, just last week. I said to the vicar, uh, could you tell me what the Wi-Fi password is? He said, I think that's really disrespectful. I said, is that all lowercase? <laughs> that's the band, ladies and gentlemen. Beautiful band, wonderful, beautiful people. Wonderful, I love you, sir. Beautiful, I love the look. Are you Mexican? You look kind of Mexican. Turn around, have a look at that. Do you like the wall? You're going to see a lot of that, let me tell you. You know, why I, you know why I build walls to keep Mexicans out? Because I'm borderline racist. And uh, no, that's not true. That's not true. That's not true. I spoke about it at, on Martin Luther Day, Martin Luther King. I knew him very well. I knew him very well. We were close. We were so close, so close. I shot him, in fact. That's how close we were. And I knew his sister, Billie Jean. Wonderful. <laughs> Billie Jean. I was the last man she ever had. I, I turned her. So, but Billie Jean was not my lover. She was just a girl who claimed that I was the one. What about Dubai? You're loving Dubai? Wonderful place. Uh, you seen the Burj Khalifa? I call it the Trump Tower. <laughs> 160 floors, actually 161, but that's another story. A bit slow, you're fired. I, uh, no, too late. I, uh, I went to the souk, I got a, a beautiful pashmina for Melania. Great swap, great swap, wonderful swap. <laughs> I even went camel racing, I gotta tell you. I'm not gonna boast, but I must have beaten that camel by about 20 lengths. <laughs> it really got the hump. Uh, okay, enough of that. Ladies and gentlemen, we're hoping also for a visit from our own uh, British Foreign Secretary, Boris Johnson. Are you familiar with Boris Johnson? Lee Johnson, do you know who you are? Yes, I, 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 st I stand before you now, the, uh, the un that's a fly. I understand, I stand before you, the, un the unlikely love child of Angela Merkel and Donald Trump, ladies and gentlemen. And I, and I say to you, it's very difficult because wherever he goes in the world, it's often been a disaster or some humanitarian thing. And he has to represent Britain and say, no, I, I see, I see to the, I see to the, uh, to the victims of this, of this appalling humanitarian catastrophe. I say, I say to you, I say, I say, I say, Hakuna Matata, <laughs> is what I say. Okay, ready to go? Let me tell you about this. This is the forum's very own chat show. 
Uh, let me tell you, it is a safe zone. Our job is merely to entertain you. A bit of information, but also mostly to entertain you and introduce some extraordinary and inspiring people, from Olympic medalists to Oscar winners to plain old computation, computational scientists, easy for me to say. All with stories to tell, experiences to share, and wisdom to pass on. So on to today's show. I think it was Tom Hanks's mother in Forrest Gump who said, uh, or it might have been Saddam Hussein, who said, life's a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. Actually, it was Saddam Hussein. It's the same with today's first show. We have a former prime minister, two starring actresses, a pair of sports stars, and a former child soldier. And all you have to do is work out which is which. Our first guest is the former lead singer of the 1970s rock band Ugly Rumours. In 1987, when the Labour Party, under his leadership, won a landslide election victory, he became the youngest prime minister since 1812. After two further election victories, his time as prime minister came to an end in 2007. He was then appointed a UN Middle East Peace Envoy, a post he held until 2015. He now heads the Institute for Global Change that bears his name, and this month he became the first British citizen to be awarded the Abraham Lincoln Leadership Prize. Abraham Lincoln, who is he? <laughs> I think I, I, the Donald Trump Prize, that's the one you want. He once said that his priority in government was education, education, education. Let's see what he has to say about education now. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Tony Blair. There you go. Does that bring back the memories of the band? <laughs> no, because they were in tune. <laughs> <laughs> That's very good. I heard you talking just now. How's, is the voice holding out? Is it okay? Yeah, just about. Because if it gives up, I can. I will do you, it for you. And you do it better than me. <laughs> but you're looking very well. Is, very, is, this, is that the Tony Blair Foundation? Or is that the... <laughs> Thank you so Look, much. I, I am well aware that I am the straight guy on this show. You're not the straight guy. I remember that weekend in Vegas. And, uh... <laughs> But what goes on tour stays on tour, Tony, let me tell you that. Can you remember That's the last... That's correct, by the way. <laughs> you have to correct it now. Can you remember the last time that, that we met? Yes. I made that big an... It was, it, was in the, it was in the south of France, and we ended up playing tennis. It was very bizarre. It I'm was, sure we met after that, but uh, we did play tennis. We did play tennis, and it was, it was me and Tony Blair against Dave Stewart of the Eurythmics and Brian Ferry. <laughs> How bizarre is that? And, and Tony turned to me afterwards, he said, Gosh, we're in the wrong job, aren't we? <laughs> but you went on to do many, many extraordinary and wonderful things. Tell me, uh, education, always been a passion of yours. Uh, you're a regular here, aren't you? What, what, what's your involvement this time? Uh, I'm, I come every year because it's, this has now become the biggest education conference in the world. Uh, it's, education is, remains a passion. Um, and what Sonny Barkey and his team have put together here is incredible. And when it first started a few years ago, by the way, I mean, it was quite a small thing. Um, I was always pretty skeptical that they could build it into what it's become today, but it's probably, it's kind of the Davos of the education world today, and uh, you know, it's wonderful to have so many people, and this is, this is the first time this has happened. Yes, right? it is, absolutely. Possibly the last, I think, actually. <laughs> uh, but education, do you think that, that is the key to, to, the, to the future, because yeah, it's, we are, it's, it's an extraordinary it's, world at the moment. Right, it's the, it's the great liberator. It teaches people how to use their innate potential and ability. And if you look around the world today, there's no country that can succeed without educating its people. And particularly in a world where technology is going to revolutionize the way the world is, now a whole new generation of technology, if we're not educating our young people, we're not giving them the chances in, in life. And, you know, I was really lucky. I had a very privileged education. And, you know, frankly, without it, I would never have gone on to do all the things I did. So, you know, the biggest injustice you can visit on a child today is a poor education. We heard yesterday from Julia Gillard who said that to empower a woman, you educate a girl. And I think that also, in a nutshell, said the, the importance that education has. Yeah, and in many parts of the world still, um, education of girls particularly is frowned upon or they don't get the same access to schooling. Um, but again, there's no country that's going to succeed if they don't use the talents of all their people, and that includes the talents of their women. 
You talked earlier on, you were uh, in a session with George Osborne, and talking about um, breaking down myths and prejudices. So a couple that I particularly uh, around Brexit and around politics generally. Um, for example, the people in Britain, they think that 24% that of, of benefits are, are fraudulently claimed, but the real figure is less than 1%. And people talk about you know, health tourism, and, 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 but that's less than 0.5% of the National Health Service budget. Do you see it as a, a big part to, to actually educate people in another sense, and that's to, to break down these myths and prejudices? Yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's very hard to have an informed debate without the information and the information being valid. So, I mean, I think one big thing today is because so much is done through social media, the, the danger is you, you, you end up just looking on social media at the things that you, know, you agree with or reinforce your prejudices rather than opening your mind to, to the possibility of thinking differently. But you know, if, if we want to protect democracy today, and it will be more under threat, I think, going forward than, than at any point in time in my, my lifetime, then you've got to have the ability to, to have an informed debate uh, based on um, a media that tries to be impartial. And part of the trouble is today is you've got you know, two groups of people, very polarized politics. Yeah. You see this in the US. Mm -hmm. you know, people are so polarized today, um, they're not talking to each other, listening to each other, or liking each other. So what's the way through that? You've got to, tr you've got to go back to building bridges, um, to, to going back to, to trying to persuade the people who disagree with you to agree with you. But today, a lot of politics is just about stacking up the numbers of people who agree with you already. Do you despair, really, about the state of the world now? Because you see so much of what Obama did being un unraveled and, and wound back, and in Brexit, of course, uh, back home. So much of what you believed in is currently under threat and being undermined, and, and Brexit, of course, threatens a great deal of that. It's disturbing, but it's also motivating. Yeah. Uh, because I think, you know, the world's made enormous, you take a step back, the world's made enormous progress. We forget this sometimes. You know, more people have been lifted out of poverty in the last 30 years than ever before in human history. All the death rates from killer diseases today in Africa are being, uh, are coming down. You know, there are millions of lives being saved by, by action, by political action. But people in the West, I think this is a Western phenomenon. Yep. You know, people in the West, have, have, they look at globalization, they look at the way the world's changing, and they're becoming frightened. And they're frightened about economic opportunity. Will the next generation do as well as this? And they're frightened by the culture, by the changes. You know, for, for me, I, I love it when you've got people from different cultures and faiths and yep. races and nations working together, living together. I think that's a great thing. And, but you know, a lot of people look at it and they get frightened by it. Do you feel in some way, though, that, that you and Obama and others, do you, do you feel in a sense that you left the door open, that there were still people that you didn't reach out to, so that when the populists and the demagogues came along, uh, the, the territory was fertile and people, people went with them and almost rejected everything you stood for? Yeah, I think, I think to a degree, you know, you, you, you've got to look at how we got to where we are. But I, I think the most important thing now is what do we do about it? Um, and I think that the really important thing for people in the West to understand is that, you know, for all the challenges, uh, we're never going to make progress if we end up blaming people, if we end up, for example, saying that the problems of the world are all to do with immigrants. This is immigration, if it's properly done, properly controlled, brings enormous energy and dynamism and vitality to a country. You look at the countries around the world today that are succeeding, those countries actually welcome in immigrants, make them feel part of their society. And you look at whether it's Silicon Valley or you look at some of the great technology companies being created in Europe today, they're often created by, by migrants. So I think one of the things that we've got to be prepared to do is to, to go back and to stand up for values that may have be under threat at the moment and temporarily out of fashion, but they are enormously important. And, and to treat people equally across the boundaries of race and faith and culture, this is the single most important battle going on in the world today. Do you think that the, 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 the problems got bigger or the politicians have got smaller? <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, it's always easy to say, by the way, since I left office, the one thing I realized is it's easier to give the advice than do the job. So, yeah. um, but no, the problems are big. There's no doubt about that. And the 21st century is, look, it's like all centuries. It's going to, it's going to require that really outstanding leadership and the defense of the right values. Do you, do you wish you had a bigger platform to do? Because I have a real sense with you that there's a lot of unfinished business, really. And, and I wonder somehow if, if that, the whole Iraq episode, the fact that it, it sort of drowns out your voice 
at a time when, in some ways, on education, on Brexit and other things, we need your voice perhaps more than ever. Yeah, but you just gotta, you've got to keep going with, with, with what you believe in. And, you know, politics is a difficult business. Uh, and, you know, there, when, when we had that conversation all those years ago, <laughs> you know, often in politics, it's, it's hard because you're, you're taking difficult decisions and um, the very nature of politics can be very controversial. But it's also immensely motivating. And today, you know, I have to I'll be honest, Brexit motivates me because I think this is a, a profound historic mistake for the country. And if there's any possible way of avoiding it, I want to play a part in it. And no matter how small my voice is, no matter how small my part is. OK, well, scandalously, uh, we only had 10 minutes, so we've run out of time. <laughs> this is I could talk for two hours. Uh, thank you very much for coming, dropping in to see us and for being part of this education forum. Tony Blair, thank you. Thank you very much. Great to see you. Thank, thank you. you. So my next two guests are actors best known as Donna and Jessica in the hugely successful TV drama Suits, a show where they play much admired, empowered women in the often male-dominated world of law. Would you please welcome Sarah Rafferty and Gina Torres. There we go. Lovely to have you live on the GESF sofa. Tell me what, you're, what brought you to this conference. What are you doing here? Uh, well, we were asked. <laughs> <laughs> That's always a great start, yes, let me and tell I, you. I must confess, it was the first time that I had heard of this conference. Mm -hmm. And I looked it up and did my due diligence. And it, I mean, it's extraordinary. It's a thing. Done here. It's a thing, yeah. It's definitely and a an thing. incredible place to have it be held. Okay, yeah. uh, so tell me, you're, you are blazing a trail, both of you, um, e even ahead of the Me Too movement, because you, 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 the empowered women, strong women in suits. Before all that, um, the characters that you play in suits are strong women. How do you feel about that, both as actors and as women? So I'll start with Sarah, maybe first. Um, you know, it's been very exciting to hear the response of young women to our characters as we've been on the show for so many years. We've mm -hmm. had a lot of feedback about it. Um, and, you know, I've really been thrilled that people are connecting to the fact that we are strong women and um, we're telling these stories. It's, and it's good as an actress, Gina, as well, isn't it? To oh, have it's those fantastic. Parts. It's fantastic as an actress. You know, you, you always want to grow, you always want to do things that. Um, maybe uh, help you understand more about yourself. And getting to play these incredible women, and Jessica Pearson in, in particular, I have to say I've, I've learned quite a bit from her. <laughs> <laughs> good, good and bad. <laughs> so what got you into acting? How did that start? I don't know. I think I, I just loved watching movies as, as a girl, and, and musicals in particular. Um, and, and who were your inspirations just, then? Yes, well, I, I, well, Fred Astaire was my boyfriend. Oh my God. <laughs> yes, yes, he was. Um, you need to do dancing. You need to do dancing with the stars. And I cheated on him with Gene Kelly. You cheated on him with Gene I Kelly. I did. It's true. Um, but I, I just adored the movie musical and and um, and wanted to be part of that world desperately. So I don't remember a time when I didn't want to be a part of this world. You should do Dancing with the Stars because that's the closest you'll get to a star. And you realize how yeah, good he was. No, it's, it's hard stuff. Yes. <laughs> it's really hard. Yeah. So who, who were your influences? You who inspired know, you? It's, it's funny, I owe it all to my teachers. Um, yes. Just to circle back to the theme of this. Yeah, because why not? when I was in high school, I was telling Gina this, I was, um, I was off to field hockey practice one day in my kilt with my stick. And um, as I was late for practice, I had to cut across um, one of my teacher's lawns. And he stepped out and he said, Rafferty, get over here, Rafferty. I was terrified. I'm, so, I'm sorry, Mr. Healan, I'm so sorry. And he said, what are you doing? Why are you going to field hockey? you got to come be in my play. And so I got a small part in Richard III, and that was the end of my field hockey career. Thank God. A small part but in Richard III. <laughs> in Richard did III. Did you play, did you play the hump on the back? Uh, the just part. the hump, just the hump. Just the hump. <laughs> um, but yeah, so he really saw so me for who I was. He knew that, you know, this, uh, this was not my truth, the field hockey stick and, yeah. the, and the kilt, that I was meant for something else. So I had the opportunity to thank him at one of my reunions. Oh, so you did? That what's meant his, a lot what was his name? Me. Kevin Healan. 
Kevin Healan, mm -hmm. and he's with us today. <laughs> <laughs> so, and here that, he comes. That's great because it's remarkable how, how much this weekend we've heard that there was a teacher who turned the people, the guests that I've been talking to, who've gone on to do great things, and there was a teacher who did that. And what came out of that was it wasn't somebody telling you what to do, it was somebody seeing the potential and saying, you need to believe this is your truth. And not giving up, not giving up on you. When I wanted to give up on myself, mm. I couldn't because my teacher still believed in me. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, you discovered the truth. What was what was that truth about? Was it that you were born to act? That you had that, you had that ability? I think it was a passion for telling stories mm. and um, and an empathy. I think yeah. that's important to bring to the craft. Yeah, I remember yeah. Uh, I had a music teacher. Uh, he, uh, jazz. His forte was jazz. He was actually a percussionist. Uh -huh. And somewhere we could do with one of those here, actually. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you see. That's brilliant. <laughs> And, uh, and we were all very, it was, a, it was a, um, an art school. So yep. we we'd, were there and, and we were having class and he said, I have to just tell you, if everyone says you're crazy, uh, you're out of your mind, yep. but you still wanna do this anyway, then you're doing the right thing. Wow. And I thought, well, there's permission that you never yeah. Get. Everyone's like, no, you're out of your mind. That's not going to work. Go do something. Go be, be a teacher. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's <laughs> get, good. get an actual profession. It's good when you. somebody gives you that license, unless, of yeah. course, you're in the White House. Well, it's, <laughs> oh. it's not quite so good. That was um, you played Zoe Washburn in Firefly, a I huge did. cult following. How does it feel to be in a show which has a following that, 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 that's that big? I, I can't believe that, I mean, we have a whole new generation of fans because the original fans have now had children um, who, have, who are actually younger than we have been off the air. So it, it's a little odd That's when I sort of meet them. Um, it's an incredible show. It was ahead of its time. I got to play yet another incredibly strong yeah. woman. Yep. Um, and so to have that be part of my legacy is a lovely thing. Cycling back to education, because you were very good at that before, um, you're the youngest of four sisters, is that right? And mother of two young daughters. So that gives you a particular perspective, doesn't it, on, on education. Um, so who had the hardest job, your mother or you? Um, certainly my mother. Um, she, she uh, I, I'm in awe of my mother because she raised the four of us while she uh, went to graduate school yep. and then became a teacher and then became the head of the Engli English department at a girls' school. I saw the kind of dedication that it took, the kind of commitment, the passion. I also continue to meet her students to this day, yep. but I remember when I was little, I was really jealous of her students, and I was really mad that my mom wasn't playing with me or, you know, was busy at the dining room table correcting papers. And then I remember it was seventh or eighth grade when I started to meet her students, and I saw the look in their eyes when they talked about my mom, and I saw that they knew a, wh a whole different side of them. She was somebody who inspired them, wow. um, and that was really incredible. And I got to bring my daughter into her classroom. So, so she's still teaching, and your daughter? She she retired a couple of years ago, but before she did, I was able I was pregnant with my second, but brought my first daughter into her classroom so that she could at least have seen my mom, you know, be the star that she was. I'm so thrilled to be here because <coughs> we're. You know, this, the, the Varkey Foundation has done an incredible job elevating teachers and education, and they really are our real stars. And I know that firsthand from observing my mom's life. So it, well, I get emotional talking about it. from a teaching family. It's really good. Gina, what was your childhood like? Oh, I grew up in New York City, uh -huh. in the Bronx. Yeah, oh, I got a woo. woo. We're in New Dubai and you got a woo. <laughs> I know. <laughs> they're they're Googling it right now. <laughs> Where is Bronx? I don't know. Where is this place? Where is this place I hear she talk about? North of Manhattan. I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> Want to get out of here alive. <laughs> so Bronx childhood. A Bronx childhood, <clears throat> uh, first generation Cuban American. My parents immigrated uh, to the States <clears throat> from Cuba before the revolution. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was, we lived in a house full of music and, and, uh, um, and a lot of love and a lot of good food. <laughs> That's what you want, isn't it? Yes. I mean, dance is right through you. I mean, you love Fred Astaire, it's in your background. I mean, you, you're going to have to go and do that. That's, it's, it's, uh, yeah, I don't think so. In all your <laughs> You don't think so? No. That's, the, that's your next role. You need, to, you need to play, I don't know, who would, who would, who would actually, what, what, what's the next part that you would love to play? Or if you, are you working on something now? 
Uh, actually, I am working on something. Um, my character, Jessica Pearson, has been spun off from Suits. Oh, she has, yes. She right. has, yes. Yeah. So, um, so I'll be starting that in the fall, and we'll be following Jessica into a new career in Chicago. And Sarah, for you? I'm staying on Suits. Staying Somebody's on Suits. Somebody's got to hold down the fort. Yeah, it's true. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll keep at it, because it's brilliant stuff. Stay with us. We've got more guests. Thank you very much indeed. Once again, to Sarah Rafferty and Gina Torres. <laughs> Thank you. I told you this show was a box of chocolates. We're going into a totally different zone now. One of my next guests is a cricketer who's on everyone's list of greatest ever players. He's certainly on mine. He's a member of the ICC Hall of Fame. He captained the West Indies in 47 test matches, scored over, I should be doing this as Jeffrey Boycott, scored over 11,000 test runs during his career. He holds the world record individual test score of 400 not out. Barack Obama described him as the Michael Jordan of cricket. That was Barack Obama, by the way. Joining him is an international footballer who played for several of the biggest clubs in English football. His company produces an app that helps teachers find jobs all over the world. Would you please welcome Brian Lara and Jermaine Jenner. I have to say, Sarah and Gina, cricket and football, two of your big subjects, I imagine. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But these are global <laughs> stars. This gentleman here, I'm a... So do you remember the last time that we met? Uh, you were trying to remind me, and um, you haven't convinced me yet. I haven't convinced you. It was at a cricket match, and you were batting, and I was bowling, and you missed. And it hit the stop, and I was the most unpopular person in the world. Because they hadn't come to watch me bowl, they had come to watch you but, but I mean, it was the Malcolm Marshall testimonial yeah. thing, uh, and I think you, I think you were quite emotional about it. Uh, well, when I say emotional, um, the hospitality was very, very good. It's very unlikely that you, you even knew what was happening. But um, tell me, how about uh, you guys? How you first became friends? Well, uh, me and Brian came over to um, the Global Schools Forum last year, actually, and um, we did a, a little talk on the link between uh, sport and education. Um, obviously. You know, first and foremost, kind of like Brian in my house. Yes. Growing up, West Indian family. Absolutely. He's like a god. Um, and, you know, so for me to meet Brian and other sporting greats at that point was, was fantastic. But, we, yeah, it was just our, our, our journey, I suppose. What's the age difference between you? I mean, was he already scoring oh, centuries yeah. and stuff like that? I was like at that, school, so? yeah. I was at school. So you met him when you were how old? 34, last year, yeah. How old are you now, Brian? I'm 48. Oh, not quite old enough to be his dad. <laughs> not, not, not quite. So did he inspire you in, in, in the sporting oh, I mean, how, sense? How can you not be inspired? Mm. Um, and I suppose, you know, that was just the sporting side of things with, with Brian. I think what, you know, having spoke to him a lot last year and listening to his story, yeah. for me, that's what always interests me most. You know, kind of how you get from that place of almost having nothing and creating uh, a legacy which he, you know, which he created is what, what fascinated me. We must talk to Brian about that. I wish he was here. Oh, you are. You are. You're here. <laughs> Tell me about that childhood. Was it a difficult childhood, and was sport the way out of it, or was it just it was that was always what you were doing? You were always playing cricket as a child, but it, you happened to be very good at it. It was a fun uh, childhood. Um, three bedroom house with eleven of us. Wow. Yeah. So, and, um, and my biggest sister said, you know, she needed a room for herself. So the rest of us had the back room. But um, but eleven. A, that's a cricket team right there. Yeah, we it? had a cricket team, and I had to bat at uh, my position, which was number ten. <laughs> you know, and I had to work my way up the order. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine playing against a cricket side that has Brian Lara batting at number 10? So, can you imagine that, Sarah? And I, uh, you're thinking... <laughs> <laughs> keeps me up at night, keeps me up at night. You put your best batsman in early, and number 10 is the last, so uh, that would be a bit of a waste. Because this guy, let's, he broke the world record for the most runs scored. Not once, he went out, he's got 375 in Antigua, and then some Australian, what was it, was it Hayden? I forget his name. He went and got, what's it? He got 300 and... 380. 380. Did he stop there or was he out? Uh, he was out. He was out, OK. And Brian just thinks, well, I'm going to have to break the record again. Gets 400. <laughs> That's in a test match. But even, big, even more than that, in a county game, it was 501, wasn't it? So just how do you, the concentration, that's, that's the key there. Because you're batting for hours and hours and hours. How do you maintain that? Oh, well, I, I think um, my f very first 100 for the West Indies. Um, we had a rain break, and I got off at 121, I think. And when I got into the dressing room, my coach at the time was Ron Kanai, another great West Indies yes, cricketer of the past. 
And he said to me, set your stalls out. I said, what do you mean? He said, your next inning starts at zero. And I realized that you know, I had to cash in. I got uh, 277 in that innings. And I fell in love with batting beyond 100. Yeah. So <laughs> well, you did it. I think uh, the record was, was it Bradman, 12? You've got 12 double centuries. He was an extraordinary batsman. But how many over the years? I didn't get to, to quite as 12. I got Seven, nine. Nine, yeah. nine double centuries. But that, that's a phenomenal effort of concentration. But is it just about getting to the next, getting to the next landmark and just starting all over again, as Rowan can I said? Yeah, well, I think 50 and 100 were never landmarks for me. I, I felt that if you're batting in a test match, most captains would bat for five sessions, and I wanted to bat for five sessions. Mm -hmm. I couldn't wait to walk into bat. I batted number three or number four on occasions. Yeah. And um, not that I wanted my, my fellow teammates to get out, but um, the minute that I had the opportunity to walk down the stairs, out into the middle, I was at home. And I didn't really want to leave that arena. And Rowan Kanna, you said he was one of your coaches. Uh, was there one that stood out in particular that saw the talent in you and brought it out? Either a teacher or a coach? Yeah, well, I started at um, Harvard Coaching Clinic at the age of six. Every Sunday morning, from January to June, my dad would take me or my sisters. That's in Trinidad, yeah? In Trinidad, and, uh, and then I went to Fatima College. And um, there were quite a few coaches in between there that really formed you know, the individual that you saw later on. And I'm very thankful. I mean, a different name, Harry Ramdas, um, Rex Dewhurst, Pat Day, they all played a very, very big part. But one day I was, uh, at, I was actually playing test cricket and uh, practicing. Yeah. And so Garfield Sobers was passing. Well, he, legend. And he said to me, you're not looking at the ball. I said, what do you mean I'm not looking at the ball? Of course I'm looking at the ball. He said, you're not looking at the ball. He said, I want you to look at the ball from the minute the ball is at the top of his mark. And follow it. When he gets at the top there, look at it. And I realized I wasn't looking at the ball. So, you know, my coaching came from all levels, from a youth and even from the greatest. It's just Barry Richards, who, you know, great batsman. He used to say that when the ball was swinging away, an outswinger, he would play for the outside of the ball. And if it was an inswinger, he played to the inside of the ball. So he's, he's seeing the ball, he's deciding which half of the ball he's going to hit. And if you see pictures of tennis players, they are looking so directly at the ball. You think it's just instinctive, but you've got to, it's an extraordinary skill. Uh, I think if I did that with Wasimakra and bowling, I, well, he was on, a, I wouldn't make a lot of runs. Well, he was on yesterday. He said you were the best batsman that he ever bowled against. So it's nice to see the compliment return because he was uh, the he best. He was definitely the best bowler. And I don't know why you'd say that because he made me look silly. Did he? Every time I went out to bat, yes. That's very hard to do. Jermaine, were there coaches that inspired you, trainers that inspired you at school, teachers that inspired you? Um, yeah, I suppose all of the above. But um, I, I always say kind of my biggest inspiration was my mum. Yeah. Um, kind of the hardship that she... Back with Sarah again. <laughs> yeah. Mothers. Uh, well, listen, I mean, they play such a, a, a vital role obviously in, in your upbringing I'm sure Brian would say exactly the same as well what they sacrifice or what my mother sacrificed to to get me onto a football pitch amount of jobs and so on and so forth um, yeah essentially created exactly who I am today so yeah I, I owe her everything yeah your parents died relatively young didn't they because your dad were well, you were 20 yeah I was, and your I was mom... actually 18 he died in um, 1989 actually the first test match that I got selected for in the squad um, he died uh, the day of the, uh, the first day, but I was not selected in the final 11. Oh, no. And um, I like telling this story because back in those days, there was a rest day in test cricket. And can you imagine the entire West Indies team coming up, Sir Vivian Richards, Clive Lloyd, Jeffrey Dujon, coming up to this little village in Santa Cruz. And my dad um, lay in his casket, and when the villagers saw the West Indies team, they all forgot my dad <laughs> oh. and went across. That's but a um, what a send off! Story. What a send off a guy, a, a, a gentleman had that. I was his last son. And the other six weren't very good. <laughs> and but um, that's wonderful. And you've continued his memory with your foundation. Yes. The the Pearl and Bunty Lara Foundation. Tell us a little about that work. Well, that started in 2002. I was having some um, kids from a home over, over to my house, and I got a call early in the morning that my mum passed away. So I cancelled the tent. I cancelled the music, and I went up to Santa Cruz to the family home. And after a couple of hours, my sisters and brothers said, you know, what are we doing later on? I said, well, I cancel. They said, no, 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 I don't think mom would want you to cancel. So we called back the kids, we called back everything, and um, we had a wonderful evening, a lot of soca music. And, you know, even though my mom passed away that morning, she was suffering a lot. And from that point in time, we uh, formed the, the foundation. foundation. And um, it's worked uh, for the last 
I know, 17 years. Went on to do more and more inspirational work. Yes. Um, Jermaine, you've got an app that works for teachers, haven't you? This is, this is what your company's doing now? Uh, yeah, well, so when I was playing professional football, I decided quite early on that I wanted um, a business once I'd yeah. retired. Because you played for more clubs than he scored runs, didn't you? I played for a few. Really? I played for a few clubs. I mean, I was at Tottenham for the biggest part of my career, which was, you know, a Oh, to the Spurs. There's there's a woo, there's they're a in the Spurs yeah. supporters. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. He's <laughs> always <laughs> a Spurs fan everywhere. Yes. Tell us very quickly about the app, because we're running short of time. No, look, it, very, very quickly. Yes, look, it's, um, it was our way, I suppose, of allowing schools to connect with teachers directly. You know, sometimes when it comes to... Um, a lot of that connection, when someone gets in the middle of it, it can cause a problem. So yeah, yeah we created this, this platform where you know, all, st all schools all over the world can connect with teachers. It's called C-Viewed. C-Viewed, uh, C-V-U-E-D. C-V-U-E-D. OK, I'm going to cut you short there because we have another guest to come on. Thank you very much indeed, Jermaine Jenis and Brian Lara. Thank you. OK, sorry to be short there, but sometimes we're fortunate to meet a person who inspires us and makes us witness to the best and worst of humanity. Words are inadequate to describe what my next guest had to endure as a child. I think it's entirely appropriate that he should be allowed to tell his own life story. Suffice to say, I'm humbled and delighted to introduce Mohamed Sidibe. Thank you for joining us, Mohammed. Uh, we've had uh, stories of happy childhoods, uh, sons, daughters of teachers, happy childhoods in the West Indies. Yours was very different. Yes. Tell me about it. Um, I was born in a country where, before I was born, the country was already engulfed in a, in a civil war. And this was Sierra Leone. This was Sierra Leone, a small country on the west coast of Africa and a former British colony, like half of the African countries. Um, and so when I was five, the rebels came to my village uh, and they decided to uh, kill my entire family. And they took me with them. Um, and from then on, I was, well, I, I did whatever they told me to do. How many uh, were in the family? It was me, my mom, my brother, my sister. So and they killed your mom, your brother, and your sister, and yes. they took you? And the way it was done is, it, the groups were still, like, was separated. Uh, and no one knew who was going to be part, uh, the group that was going to survive and the group that was going to die. And so it was completely uh, random. Uh, and I don't know why it was that I wasn't killed. Um, but all I knew was that um, my life will have changed. And so it was, instead of being killed, you were going to fight for them? You were a child soldier? Well, yes. And so they took me. I had this illusion that I could run away. So six months when I was with them, I tried to run away. Uh, and I was captured, uh, I was beaten and burned, I have a lot of scars on my body, uh, and I was left there to die, but I somehow survived, and I was told that if I ever try to run away again, um, I'll be killed. And I lived in a world where uh, there's a very thin line from being a forced perpetrator to being a victim. And did they, I mean, they put a gun in your hands at the age of five? Yep. And I mean, AK-47, the danger of guns like AK-47 An AK-47? Uh, there's fine. no recoil on AK-47, which makes it easier for kids to use. And when you put the gun straight down, the gun was taller than me. Um, but yet here I was uh, told to carry it and told to kill or be killed. That was my thing. Did you have to prove yourself by killing other people? Well, you don't really have a choice. Uh, when they tell you to shoot, you shoot. Um, because I lived in a world where your best friend at 2.30 uh, could kill you at 2.31 if uh, they tell them to kill you. If someone gives you an instruction, say shoot that person and you refuse or you question, uh, they're going to get someone else to shoot that person and then they're going to get that person to shoot you. So even as a child, you've got to make a decision in your mind that even though what's happening around you is horrendous and horrible that you have to you have to fight or you're, you're the next to be killed well it's not really so much of a decision I mean all the decision is, is Sophie's choice really yes um, yes. and so it's not really much of a decision because all the decision has been uh, made for you you are just uh, a machine um, told to do uh, doing what you're told to do and nothing else. Do you have, are you able to keep even a small part of your mind that is recognizing that this is crazy or do you have to become that person? 
sometimes when you grow up in a certain situation, um, you, don't, you don't dream. You don't dream because you don't know anything else. And so for me, uh, most of my childhood was that. I didn't, you know, became, came to a point where I, don't, I didn't know a life beyond that which I was living. And so I didn't really know the idea of morality, what is good and what is bad, um, didn't exist in that world. Tell us more, how did it continue from, from the start? How long, was, how long did this? The war ended for over a decade, and people often ask, like, why is it that a poor African country like Sierra Leone could have such a prolonged civil war? Simple, diamonds. Um, people came in, um, but diamonds being supplied from, you know, Charles Taylor and his people in Liberia, and they gave um, guns and drugs in exchange for diamonds. And so um, to some people, it was a business. Mm -hmm. And that's how the war went on uh, for so long. But eventually, people started asking the why question. Why do I want to live in this world where I'm not guaranteed the next second, the next minute, or the next day? And that's what ended the war. So who were your commanders? Who was telling you to do this? C.O. Rambo. Um, he was the devil incarnate, um, the devil himself in the image of an average Joe. Um, and so he was in charge. And he does... And everyone. they would do what he said without question? Yes. Okay. And did you ever have to take up the role of, of telling other people what to do as well? Did no. they trust you enough? You were always no. a soldier, never yes. an officer. And like never. In that sense? Yeah. I see. And so, okay, another decade, and how, how did this story end? My story or the war? Yeah, well, the, both. The war eventually, like I said, the war eventually ended, um, and our lovely friends at the UN, who always managed to show up fashionably late, um, arrived, and they facilitated the peace process. Uh, and so for me, here I was, living on the streets of Freetown, um, with no family, no home. As Africans, you have extended families. Um, but that is if your immediate family is around. And for someone like me who've lost my family, at a, you know, who lost my family at a very young age, I didn't know any immediate family. So therefore, uh, Red Cross sent me to um, a family who had a similar name to me. And I, real and I arrived, realized the only thing we had in common was the last name and nothing more. Um, two months later, I was on the streets um, in Freetown. Goodness me. And from there, how do you pick yourself up again? I mean, this is extraordinary. This is a story of resilience and, and living through challenges which we can only barely imagine. I think, for me, is I've had people who have helped me along the way, um, mainly women, um, people who believed in me. Uh, and I soon realized, I was soon made to realize that education um, was my only way out. So I lost everything, and I bet on education. I was able to do that because of the opportunities I was provided. Um, but had I remained in Sierra Leone, I would have never graduated high school. So who, who, who were your educators at that point, who you said that education was the way out? It's, it's who a did girl. you turn to? Oh. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a girl called Saleh. Um, Saleh was a girl in my class who taught me how to read and write uh, in exchange. I will uh, wake up every morning, I will help her family do laundry, I will get water for them, I will do domestic work for them. In exchange, her family will allow her to tutor me half an hour every day. And how old are you at this point? 25. My goodness. And life is beginning again. Yes. How extraordinary. Yes. So what brings you to this festival? Because clearly the story that you tell yeah. is uh, it's a chilling one, an, an extraordinary story. Uh, what what do you do you pass on to people from your life story? Is that that knowledge is infinite in itself. It doesn't discriminate against gender, nationality, race, or origin. Access and opportunity are restricted. They're restricted because of where people were born uh, and the passports that they hold. And so what I bring to these events is that education is our only way out. Imagine trying to control a group of, imagine a football stadium yeah. of youth or hooligans, 50,000. It's very difficult to control them. Yes. Now imagine half a billion young people around the world who do not have education. How are you going to control them? You can either use their minds and help bridge the gap, or the world is very yeah. unstable. 
And you've almost got to do that one child at a time, really, yes. because you know they're all different. And, and I mean, particularly now in the world, there is so much conflict going on in the world, and there's so many individual children who are being scarred in one way or another by then. Do you, do you meet a lot of other children who've gone through those, got, not just like here, where we're, uh, it's mostly teachers and educationalists, yes. but do you actually meet a lot of children who've been through I, I have. Um, and you know, running a program, I run a small um, project in Sierra Leone, um, sending kids to school, and part Part of the, the stipulation for the kids who are in my program is that they have to, I will cover the tuition, um, 76 of them are girls, I will cover the tuition everything else. In exchange, they have to give me five hours a week, and that five hours is they have to tutor someone else in a program, mm -hmm. or they have to do civic engagement in their community. Um, and so that's how I'm running the... Yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm just awestruck by this, the, the, the story of turning tragedy into, in, into a triumph in, in its own way and that you're em empowering. This is another thing, people, it's a buzzword of the week really, that education empowers people and what you're doing. So how many children have gone through that already? So I started a program last year, mm -hmm. um, so 101 kids, and so the goal is to expand it. Uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to law school, so which is going to uh, <laughs> add on my workload. Um, and. <laughs> There's no stopping you now. It's just, uh, it's wonderful. No, I mean, I think that the, the truth is, we spend so much time highlighting our differences as humans mm -hmm. that sometimes we forget how similar we really are. Mm. We're not that different. Mm. The only thing that separates people is opportunity and access, and I think that's what we need to understand. Do you know, I thought Vladimir Klitschko was the most impressive person I was going to meet today, but he, you've just knocked him out of the park. It's just extraordinary. Uh, we're all going to talk about, I just, gonna, I, I think a, a round of applause at this point is, I mean, I, others guys here, I mean, uh, had you heard of Mohammed before? Had you heard his story? Sarah, you're nodding. You, yes. you had. We met yesterday. <laughs> okay. Uh, I mean, what, what can you say to a story like that? It's, it's, it's beyond our experience, isn't it? Beyond our imagination, almost. Yeah. It, your story is incredibly powerful. I mean, you know, and it makes such a, a, a beautiful case for accessibility. Um, you know, it's, it's our moral imperative at this mm. time to give access to the millions of children who don't have access to school. Absolutely. You, I mean, not to be, but as we've got sportsmen here as well and actors here, I mean, we talked about education. Are some of the children you've come across, uh, are they likely to go on to, I don't know, to, to, to find a way through sport, to be coached into different things? What are they, because uh, they're all different, as I said, so they're going to have different, different skills, different abilities. Yeah, um, so I mean, one of the things I've tried to do as I look to scale up the project is the social credit idea to have kids get um, in this rural part to accumulate social credit that they can redeem uh, and that if you want to do a computer literacy class you can redeem your social credit and we will pay for you to do a computer literacy class if you want to do a tailoring class if you want to do um, uh, mechanics whatever it is in, in you know in conjunction to going to school because I am I know that not all of them are going to go to university but even if they drop out of the program, at least they're going to have a skill, a skill that they're going to choose that's going to get them employed in their community. Absolutely. Um, and are you ex planning to sort of extend this across the world? Because there are that is so many plan. areas of conflict. Yes, that's so, the goal. So it's Sierra Leone at the moment. Yes. And uh, where's, where, where next, do you know? Um, I think right now I'm going to just focus on Sierra Leone until I finish law school. Okay. And then I'll try to scale it up. Roll it out even more. And what support have you found? I mean, I imagine it's an open door wherever you turn now. Well, I, whilst I was just um, speaking with um, Dubai Cares, and so I am hoping to, uh, to work to, for them to be like my first partners. Um, but since I only started the program last year, and the way I was able to, I crowdfunded for, um, for the program. And what I did was 100% of what was donated went into the program. And there's the kid, the kid who runs the program for me, the day-to-day -day program for me. Um, he just finished high school and he's ready to go to college. And so I am paying for his college university tuition uh, as payments for him running the program, the day-to-day -day program for me in Sierra Leone. So it's, it's really taking off. Yes. What an extraordinary transformation from that five-year-old losing his family and being given a gun to where you are now. Um, all I can say is, is it's been an honor to meet you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Mohamed Sidibe, Brian Lara, Jermaine Jenner, Sarah Rafferty, Tina Torres. Thank you all so much.
Thank you also to our wonderful band and to you, our audience. I'm Rory Brenner. This has been GESF Live. I'm back in an hour for our last show featuring actors Taron Egerton and Nicholas Holt, scientist Ayad Rahwan, former US Vice President Al Gore, and Vladimir Putin. Really? No, but it, you won't know unless you tune in. Goodbye.